Thank you very much, Dirk. It's always a pleasure to come to uh, ODI um, uh, and back to England. I was trained in England at Sussex University, and I live here for nine years of my life. So it's always a pleasure to come back here to, 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 to the UK. Um, ODI is now becoming a traditional uh, stopover in the launches of the of the IDRs. I see Sheila Page here that was um, in the present in the previous one with, and made some very pointed questions that I'm still trying to answer. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I also want to uh, I, I want to thank you, Dirk, for organizing this, and ODI for hosting me this time, and Jody for very kindly reading some of the report, if not all of it. Uh, also, Shalom Fu, who we have a long relationship uh, with, uh, with at Oxford University, and we are involved with her in 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 in, in the work that's been done in, te in technology and innovation at, at Oxford. Uh, our director general was re recently. Um, involved in, in, in some presentations there. And finally, I want to also thank Margaret uh, for her um, commenting. Um, we have been reading her extensively, and she might find even herself quoted in this report, or I hope she is. Um, <coughs> having said that, let me now start telling you a bit about, and uh, 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 one, one final point. Um, the linkages with ODI go just beyond this presentation. ODI did actually contribute to with a background paper, which is heavily included in one of the chapters of, of, of the of the IDR. So thank you for that too, Derek. Okay, let me start now talking about what the IDR is about. Um, I think that the, the report focuses on four things. Uh, first, it's a global and long-term trend analysis of industrial structural change and employment. We start, the data we use starts in 1963, and we have a, for the, uh, that data until 2009, 2010. And that's the kind of analysis we do. I want to point out one thing here. What we argue in the report very strongly is that its employment is generating through structural transformation. It is the structural transformation in manufacturing that generates employment. And that is that, that you can ex examine in the first three chapters of, of the report, which are the most analytical ones when we explore in deep this relationship between structural transformation within manufacturing and, 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 and employment generation. I will not go into too much detail into those chapters because those are the most technical ones, lots of data, lots of regressions, or the, 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 the not put there, the underline the analysis. We do not, we tend not to put regressions in the report uh, because our readers tend to be policymakers. But uh, uh, you, we, we, we can always provide them to you if you want. Um, then we look into what are the drivers of manufacturing. That's the second part of the report. And we looked into issues like, like wages, technology, uh, skills, whatever, what, what are the main, main drivers of manufacturing. The third part then discusses in the industrial policies that lead to structural change and through structural change to manufacturing employment generation. And we finalize our report by looking at the role of the international community. So that is uh, more or less what that report contains. I'm not going to cover all the issues, there, there are too many. I'm just going to focus on a few messages that arise out of the report. Okay, um, <coughs> main findings. Is manufacturing still an engine of growth and employment generation? That's the first thing that we wanted to address here. And the first point I want to make is a connection between uh, manufacturing growth and economic growth. And if you see here, uh, the we have here on the on the left on the uh, uh, y-axis we have the annual uh, growth rate of GDP per capita, and on the x-axis we have the annual average growth rate ch change in manufacturing industry, the change. And you see that there is, there, there is correlation between growth and 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 um, change in manufacturing industry, and you can see that the Chinas, the Eastern Europe in, in latest period, etc., have the highest change in manufacturing uh, industry and the highest growth of change in, 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 in growth as a whole. Um, we also looked here at the uh, uh, case of the Republic of Korea, and we do the same analysis from 1960 to, to 2005. In 1960, Korea had roughly $1,744 per capita income at PPP, 2000 PPP, uh, with an industry accounting for 10% of GDP. By 2005, uh, the income per capita of Korea was $22,000 per capita, with an industry roughly accounting for 28, 30% of GDP on average. So, okay, the, the idea here is to show that there is a relationship between manufacturing growth and economic growth. Uh, <coughs> GDP growth in Korea during that period was 5.5%. Okay, <coughs> are we facing a post-industrial society? That's an, uh, <coughs> Does manufacturing still matter for employment generation? And we, there were around 272, 62 million jobs in 1970, manufacturing jobs. 
by 2009, there were 471 million jobs. Today, we must have more than half a billion jobs in manufacturing. 16.3% of global employment is accounted by manufacturing at the moment. <coughs> Let's look at the, the compose these figures for a, li for a little while. Um, and look, direct jobs, jobs generating in production, factories, grew from two 1995 to 2009 from 180 million to 201 million jobs. Informal jobs grew from 130 million to 187 million. I want to clarify what I mean by informal jobs here. Informal jobs means also jobs that are under 15, under 15 20 hours a week or that are paid uh, or are not paid the minimum wage. But above all, we also have here figures for jobs created in SMEs because the way the accounting, in, uh, the accounting of those official statistics take place, it normally does not consider SMEs. And we found, we've estimated the jobs that have been generated in SMEs, and it's, it's a good chunk of informal jobs are generated in SMEs. So it's not informal in the traditional ILO sense. It includes lots of SME uh, employment, which in Japan, for example, are very high tech. So, I, and this is another novelty that we have included in the report, which we'll call indirect jobs. And these are jobs generated in manufacturing related services, which have gone from 64 million to 108 million. Now, um, <coughs> um, we are only counting here <coughs> to total employment 374 to 471 million jobs in 2009, as I said. Now, we are not <laughs> counting here indirect jobs, input out relationships. We're just counting here manufacturing related services jobs, those that are related to manufacturing. Research and development for a company that's manufacturing, marketing for, for, for manufacturing products, logistics for to move cars from one place to another. That's the kinds of jobs we're counting here. We are not counting indirectly generated jobs. Okay, <coughs> and roughly, so you can see what has happened there, it's, um, uh, it's gone up from 1995 from 61.1% of total employment to 16.3% of total employment over the last 15, 20 years. Let me give you a bit of our jobs traveling away. Let's look into the geographic composition of jobs. And it is, tr it is true that there is uh, manufacturing employment grows in developing countries massively, declines in, the, in developed countries. We all know that. However, and this is, I think, the important thing, is that in developed countries, decreases are mitigated by growing manufacturing related services employment. And I'll show you some figures where there is loss in production of jobs, but there is some compensation, not total, but some compensation in manufacturing related services jobs, which are growing within the total uh, employment of manufacturing. <coughs> where are the jobs going? Let me start by looking first at developing countries and industrialized countries. In 1970, there were about 130 million jobs in manufacturing industry in developing countries which has grown roughly to 370 million in 2009. In developed countries, in 1970, there were roughly 120 million jobs in manufacturing industry, which has grown roughly gone down to around 100 million jobs in 2009. Uh, if we look geographically by, by areas, um, North America, let's say Europe had 81 million jobs in in uh, two, two 1995, and it has uh, 71 million jobs in, in 2009. A good deal of this is explained by the jobs losses in the USSR and Eastern Europe, by the way. Not all of it, but some of it is explained by that. In North America, you had 23 million jobs in 2009, and 29 million jobs in, 2000, in 1995. The biggest growth is Sub-Saharan Africa, for example. It had 20 million jobs in 2009, as opposed to 16 million jobs in 1995. Sub-Saharan manufacturing employment is growing. The biggest growth of is in Latin America, 58 million jobs in 2009, uh, 21 million jobs in 1995. Huge increase. A lot of it is informal employment in, in, in Latin America. And Asia, of course, East Asia had 164 million jobs in 1995, more than 200 million jobs in 2009. Okay, <coughs> this is another uh, phenomenon I want to uh, show, which is the changing composition of employment in developed countries, in industrialized countries. 
um, at the uh, around 120 million, 115 million jobs that we had in 1995 for industrialized countries, with a composition of roughly one quarter was manufacturing related services jobs. And uh, has gone down to around, uh, around 100 million, as I said, with an increase in the composition of manufacturing related services jobs to inc has increased to 30%. Yeah, there's change in the composition. Production jobs are now 70%. Manufacturing related services in the composition grown to 30%. And I'll show you some figures for specific industries later on. Okay, <clears throat> what is there uh, in manufacturing for the least developed and lower middle income countries? So let's focus on least developed countries now and see what's happening here. Least in developed countries have immense potential for industrialization in food and beverages, textiles and garments, which provide very rapid unemployment growth, high productivity potential. Let me show you some figures here. Here I'm, I'm, I'm plotting value added per capita in US dollars and GDP per, per capita from zero to $6,000 per capita, roughly. And it shows you the evolution of the different industries in terms of uh, at the, the different levels of per capita income. And if you can see here, for instance, the food and beverages industries grows, its value added per capita grows very rapidly at very low levels of development, very low levels of income. Uh, value added per capita goes very rapidly. If you can see chemicals, textiles, and wearing an apparel, a value added per capita grows very rapidly up to $6,000 per capita. Mm -hmm. In chemicals, the difference is that here we're talking about low tech chemicals, soap. These are the kinds of products that we are, are, being, are being developed. The chemical industry, you will see later, it continues growing, but the nature of composition of it changes. Um, and wearing, wearing apparel, now, if you look at the employment figures here, per capita, you can see, for example, food and, food and beverages, just focus on the left-hand side on the $6,000 and the six thousand dollars per capita. You can see that food and beverages goes, employment continues growing, in fact, goes beyond $6,000 per capita and carries on growing until $15,000 per capita. You can see there that also, for example, the wearing an apparel, employment grows until $6,000 and even up to $10,000 per capita, employment carries on growing in the wearing and apparel, and in textiles, employment grows up to roughly four, five thousand dollars per capita, and then declines. What happens in terms of productivity is that we see that roughly for low and lower middle income countries per capita, the blue line is industry excluding manufacturing. Industry excluding manufacturing that is construction, uh, uh, energy, and uh, mining. The red one is manufacturing. Uh, the uh, services is the yellow one, and the light blue at the bottom is agriculture. This is productivity relative to average productivity. That is what this figure is. And you see in that low, in at the under six and a half thousand dollars per capita, manufacturing productivity is higher than services and equal to non-manufacturing related industries. It's the highest productivity. So the, by entering these industries, uh, I mean, food and industry, textiles, garments, <coughs> the countries benefit <coughs> from three advantages. Employment, output, and higher levels of productivity. What is there for middle-income countries? What is in for them in this manufacturing game, so to speak? Um, <coughs> of course, middle-income countries have to move into middle-range industries. What is the advantage of moving to them? In that you have intermediate and investment goods that are critical for the accumulation, for further accumulation <laughs> in, 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 and, and further development, and are heavily demanded. One thing that we've noticed is that these industries, uh, uh, we're talking about e even cement, but you're talking about aluminum, steel, all these industries now are in heavy demand internationally. So exports of these industries are growing massively. Uh, and still, they have large potential for increases in productivity. And in, I want to show you again, this is the upper middle income countries, so between six and a half thousand dollars per capita and fifteen thousand fifteen and a half thousand dollars per capita. That's roughly where middle income countries are located. And you will see that the red line, uh, especially between six and a half thousand and twelve thousand dollars per capita, the red line, which is manufacturing productivity, is higher. It, mining, uh, utilities, productivity grows much faster because of that, that said it becomes capital intensive, but manufacturing is not far behind. So middle incomes come by moving, by shifting their production structure towards uh, uh, capital intensive goods or uh, 
they can benefit from increases in productivity, at least more than the average, and by uh, they able to generate an accumulation process based on investment goods. What is there left for high-income countries? What <coughs> and <coughs> High-income countries have clearly openings in, in high high tech industries for innovation. That's that that's the where they have to specialize clearly. And and what we are observing now is how the shift in jobs, as I mentioned before, away from the production to marketing service, etc. That's a very clear trend. I'll, I'll, I'll show you again. Focus on the right-hand side uh, of the of the of the of the chart. And you can see chemicals, an industry that at even at $40,000 per capita continues growing. This includes now pharmaceuticals, um, <laughs> fine chemicals, etc. It continues growing, it doesn't stop. You can see uh, all food and beverages at around $40,000 per capita stops growing. Um, but there you see electrical machine and, and apparatus, high tech, start continues growing $40,000 per capita and beyond. These are the high-tech industries where innovation matters a lot. And look at the bottom, textile and wearing and apparel. Give them up. <laughs> Sorry, but they make no sense anymore for high-income countries. Okay, And this is the process of development in a way. Shifting, and I want to show you here the figures for the chemical industry, where uh, this is uh, in 1995, the share of the blue part is production, production, and the upper part is the different types of services related to the chemicals industries. And I have business services, financial intermediate manufacturing, uh, manufacturing is blue, other service, transport, wholesale, etc. And you see how the share of those services increases from roughly 35% in 1995 to 45, 48% in 2009. Okay, <coughs> quickly I will uh, discuss about what drives industrial structural change and employment generation. The report goes into all kinds of drivers and uh, we focus first on issues like <laughs> wages, skills, technology and innovation. We also focus on emerging drivers like resource efficiency and all the environmental issues that are being brought into manufacturing. But I think the most important lesson here from this part of the report is that what we found out was that the impact of any of these drivers always had to do with the set of policies that were being implemented by the, by, by the country. Uh, trade, technology, whatever driver you look into, its impact is in the final analysis or its positive impact through structural transformation. One employment is in the final analysis determined by the set of policies that the country is implementing. Just give you one example here, and the, the report goes extensively to elaborate on this, but I'll just give you one example here, the two phases of innovation. And we have here innovation inputs, R&D, as one of the traditional inputs of innovation, and at the bottom you have other inputs like engineering, technical change, production, uh, uh, changes that take place at the level of production. And those may lead into product innovation, product and process innovation, or process innovation. Now, if you look at process innovation, there's clearly job destruction. By definition, you put in your subsidy capital for labor. So you will reduce employment. But uh, there's an area at the middle always, but at the, on the other hand, R&D investment, new product development, generates employment because you generate new industries. iPods, iPads, all, all, all these gadgets generate employment. Now, how countries have been able to compensate for the losses of employment at one level based by enacting policies that push up innovation and, 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 and generate new, new products and new industries. And that's where technology can become employment generating with the adequate policy uh, management. Okay, <coughs> and this is I think my last transparency. Um, what role for industrial policy content and process? The reporting elaborates seen a couple of chapters on, 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 on policy. And I will not go through all the list of the wish list that we have there, but I will just point out the three, uh, five issues that arose in that chapter. First, that policies do not have to focus on employment, they have to focus on promoting structural change. It is through structural change that you create sustained employment. Yes, on, on occasions you may want to come to want to 
temporarily save jobs, but jobs are not safe if there's no structural change in the long run. Second point is that one has to target the key drivers. In some countries, innovation is the more important, more important driver. In other countries, wages or skills are the most important driver of structural change. And there has to be a set of policies that addresses the specific drivers of specific countries at specific moments. That's another uh, co um, big conclusion of, of the report. Um, another thing that came out of the report is, yes, you may have brilliantly designed policies uh, innovation policies and the content of me may be very well designed. You may have your fiscal incentives, your subsidies, everything well done. But as important as the content of policy is to have a transparent process of, achieve, of reaching and identifying those, those policies and objectives. There has to be owners, ownership by the private sector. They have to be involved. The university have to be involved in the process. It has to be um, uh, a legitimated process, it has to be a transparent process, there must be ownership. All these dimensions of policy making are critically important for the policies to work eventually. Um, I think this is, this is standard in, in, in the literature, but I'll say it again. Policy processes are a, a process of experimentation, learning. You try once, you get it right, you may try another thing, you may get it wrong, and you have to go back to the drawing board and learn, experiment, go back to the drawing board. It's a po process of constant experimentation. It is not true that you have a policy and things work exactly the way, the way you, you anticipate it. It doesn't happen like that. You get it wrong most of the time, and you have to adjust. So, and that's, that's an important lesson. And finally, we discuss about a bit about the international cooperation, the role of international organization and international community in, in promoting structural change. And we address a couple of issues like bilateral treatment, bilateral investment treaties, we address issues of private standards as uh, factors promoting employment. And finally, we discuss the post-2015 development agenda, where we strongly argue that for employment to take place, we have to, the post-2015 development agenda has to go back to addressing issues of productive capacities, of establishing productive capacities as the main means of alleviating poverty and generating employment. And I stop there, 22 really? minutes. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Very good. Well, thank you very much. Uh, important note to finish on, the importance of employment generation and pr productive capacities in the, in the post-2015 world. But I think there are some interesting numbers that you have presented, so that manufacturing jobs in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa is increasing, mm -hmm. from 17 million to 21 million, which is yeah. quite an interesting uh, uh, statistic. Um, and we'll have to see how, what, what, what will happen in, into the future but also the importance of, of uh, promoting structural change for continued job, uh, job uh, generation. And, and uh, I mentioned this meeting that we, uh, we, we had uh, last, last week where uh, you presented also this nice chart about the importance of gar the garment sector in, in, in Bangladesh. And uh, uh, so Bangladesh is still an LDC, but it's, it's getting richer. And uh, it's, um, uh, it, it, it's a very important industry, $25 billion uh, for, uh, for Bangladesh. Uh, but of course, uh, and lots of jobs, so four million jobs. Uh, but at some point, uh, the, ch the chart that you showed will kick in. Mm -hmm. uh, so that will, uh, Bangladesh will grow richer, and then maybe the contribution of the garment sector to Bangladesh will, will decline. And I think that that was also a, a message that that was really uh, that stuck in the in the minds of the, of the policymakers there mm -hmm. as well. Uh, is that the uh, is we need to think? Yeah, thinking <laughs> the party's <laughs> over. In your words, is, uh, is you need to think yeah. about the future as well. Uh, um, in, in in ten years' time or so. Mm -hmm.